So today's lecture, we're going to look at um, kind of the major population movements, uh, if you like, the peopling of the world, how, how people got to the various parts of the world, and looking at some of the uh, deep branches within humanity. Again, it's always difficult to know how to chop this stuff up into discrete lectures. There's some stuff about Africa that we could have perhaps put in an earlier lecture, but we'll, we'll cover it nonetheless in this lecture, try and keep things even-handed. So we're going to look at Africa, Europe, India, China, and the Americas uh, in double-quick time. So when we look at Africa, uh, you can see there are a number of different African language groups which to the first approximation at least, probably uh, reflect the various uh, populations genetically in terms of their uh, origins. The biggest group are this so-called uh, Niger-Congo group, um, and the major subcomponent of that, uh, Niger-Congo B, is sometimes called the Bantu group of languages and the Bantu group um, of, uh, of peoples. And it's thought that they originated in West Africa, migrated into Central Africa, into Equatorial Africa, and then began a migration southwards. I'm not going to say much about those, but the, another group, sometimes known as the Khoisan or the San, uh, probably originated over here in East Africa, and then migrated down to where they are mo now most uh, common, uh, in Southwest Africa and Southern Africa. So the San is a name that's given to this diverse group of individuals that live in southwest Africa and southern Africa. They have until recently lived as hunter-gatherers. Although looking at this guy here, you can see they don't all work as hunter-gatherers anymore. They live as hunter-gatherers. They have adopted a western lifestyle to some degree. The interesting feature of these individuals and the, the ones in East Africa that they're thought to be related to is they speak what we call click languages. So you'll hear in a moment this guy speaking a click language. And, and it's thought that there is a relationship between the San and these other click language speakers. But let me just uh, see if we can get that microphone there so you can hear things. Um, this was when I went to South Africa in February and actually went to a San a uh, centre where they actually uh, present the sound lifestyle and tell you about their history and so yeah, thing is that actually those clicks have ingressed into some of the Bantu languages. So languages like Zulu and Oza also have clicks in them, but they've come from those uh, San. So what about the San? Well, this uh, paper from a couple of years ago points out that actually this group is the most diverse group. If you look at um, sub-Saharan lineages, mitochondrial genomes, um, and they, they, this, they pay particular attention to the, to the San and the Khoi, uh, this, so sometimes called together the Khoi San, um, and they estimated that they diverged from other populations uh, as long ago as 90,000 to 150,000 years ago. Um, so this really is the deepest branch within humanity. Uh, in, in, and um, if you look at the lineages within <coughs> the uh, mitochondrial lineages here, you see this massive uh, <coughs> just branch, early branch here that gives rise to these Khoisan lineages that found it in South, Southern Africa, Southwest Africa. Very long branch lengths. And then over here, you've got everything else. You've got all of the other lineages in Africa. And then here, well, probably most of the people in this room are represented by just this one little lineage here, the out of Africa lineage. So it's thought that these individuals probably initially lived in East Africa and then moved over here. And there are these mitochondrial haplotypes known as the L0 haplotypes and various varieties of L0D uh, and L0K uh, that are particular to this group. Um, so just uh, actually zooming in a bit more, you can see that this the out of Africa stuff is just so 
recent compared to the divergence of this group here and, and uh, many of the things that we see in the archaeological record of uh, kind of modernization and so forth, long <coughs> after the divergence of, of, of the sand groups uh, from uh, others. Not quite sure why it's gone back to that again. Oh, it's now showing you the top part of that, just uh, uh, zooming in there. So you can see around, uh, between uh, going to this particular tree here, between 140,000, 160,000 years ago, we got the, the um, uh, first, the divergence of the of various L0 groups. Um, and some, you know, we, we placed the root of all modern humans somewhere around 200,000 years ago. So very early branching here from this particular group. Looking at whole, um, looking at larger uh, data set, looking at whole uh, mitochondrial genomes, uh, these individual, this group here, Tishkoff et al, uh, came up with a very similar kind of picture, which was the, the, the Khoisan actually are very uh, early branching, but they found some relationship also with these uh, ethnically diverse Tanzanians uh, and, and uh, uh, these pygmies, which also, some of which also speak click languages. So it seems that this earliest branch there is probably originated in East Africa, migrated down to Southern Africa. Now that was interesting, but even more interesting, uh, last year in February, we actually got the first complete genomes from individuals from this branch uh, of humanity. Uh, and they looked at uh, these, these Khoisan uh, individuals. There's a bit of a strangeness here that Khoisan is quite often used in the literature, but when I went and saw these San guys, they said they don't use that term for their own description of themselves. That's something that some anthropologists made up in the early 20th century, and they much prefer to be called uh, just the sun. But anyway, this is a name that's stuck. So the sun, uh, as it says here, studies based on earlier markers show that they are genetically divergent from other humans, uh, but this was the first time that they actually had genomes. So they report the, the, the whole genome and exome diversity among five men, um, including uh, a Bantu and some Kalahari uh, 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 Bushmen, uh, they found 1.3 million novel differences between uh, these uh, individuals, including 13,000 amino acid variants. Um, and the key takeaway message is the difference between uh, one Bushman and the next Bushman it can be as great as the difference between a European and a Chinese individual in terms of genetic diversity. So not only is this the earliest branch but it also harbors the most diversity uh, uh, among uh, these kind of human branches, <coughs> among populations that are actually living close together. So uh, this uh, is the, the region that they uh, chose to sample, um, and these are the individuals that they uh, sequenced the genomes of, did it with informed consent, explaining to them what this meant and what it was all about. And this guy here, some of you might recognize, is Bishop Desmond Tutu, celebrated his birthday last week, I think it's 90th birthday, wasn't it? Um, and uh, they chose various different ethnic groups, language groups within the Bushmen to get some variation there. Um, and they looked at the chromosomes. Uh, and um, what they found actually was that uh, Bishop Tutu, despite the fact that he is classified, if you like, is considered to be uh, from a Bantu group, uh, he's actually got some uh, admixture from uh, the Bushmen as well. Um, so this is just looking at the, uh, the kinds of SNPs, uh, the number of SNPs that you see. Um, if you look here uh, on one side, you've got the different Bushmen, and you can see that when you compare uh, them, you see these kind of thousands of SNPs uh, well, in fact, these are millions of SNPs, there's thousands and thousands of SNPs. And if you compare the same kinds of diversity between J. Craig Venter and, and a Chinese individual here, uh, you see that we're, we're getting, you know, actually more variation between these Bushmen uh, in terms of the numbers of SNPs than we get between uh, 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 someone of European descent, or in case of American, but uh, American of European descent and a Chinese individual from the Han Chinese ethnic group. So, 
just to put that in context, we've got 117 megabases of exome. The average dif difference, we see 1.2 base pair change per kilobase compared to 1.0 per kilobase between a, human, uh, between a, a European um, and a Chinese. Uh, most of these SNPs are changes that have accumulated in that Bushman lineage since they diverged from other populations. So they may represent adaptations to the Bushman's life, to their diet, to the way they are, or they may be just neutral variation. But uh, we've got, as I say, also this interesting phenomenon that when you look at uh, Tutu's uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA, uh, you see that he actually has this L0 haplotype. He's inherited from his mother and from her mother and so forth. So he has uh, some admixture from the, the Bushman. Um, and the, but he has a Bantu-specific Y chromosome. Um, oh, sorry, no. Actually, I miss, he, he does have a Bantu-specific Y chromosome. The other point is that one of the Bushmen actually has a Bantu-specific Y chromosome. So there obviously has been uh, intermixing between these two different groups, these two different lineages. In fact, this has political implications. While I was there in South Africa, there was a big row uh, going off because... One of the members of the ANC had said there were too many coloureds, as they call them, uh, in the Cape province, in the Western Cape. Um, and what they meant by coloureds in South Africa means people of mixed race. Uh, and it uh, usually means people who have a mixture of Bantu um, and uh, Bushmen and maybe uh, Asian and maybe European admixture as well. Uh, and... and, and as a kind of uh, call of uh, statement of solidarity, uh, Tutu said, well, he's coloured uh, by these criteria because when you look at his ancestry, he's got Bushman and Bantu. Um, as I say, it's all it's very politicised in, in South Africa, this whole issue. Just a couple of words on the Bantu before we move on to, out of Africa to other places. Um, it's thought that within the past 5,000 years, the, the Bantu... Uh, expansion has occurred, moving originally from Nigeria and Cameroon into the equatorial rainforest and then down into eastern and southern Africa. So they are now, if you like, the predominant sub-Saharan uh, language group and, 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 and the largest ethnic group as well, uh, that take up most of, uh, of southern Africa. Um, and it appears to be uh, uh, two waves. There's one... Um, uh, migration from West Africa into Central Africa and then a, a second migration. And here's a paper that came out a few years ago looking at languages. So we've up till now been talking about looking at genes and gene sequences, but you can do kind of parallel analyses trying to draw uh, phylogenetic trees from languages, looking at similarities between different languages. Um, and they uh, drew this conclusion here. Where they say that they did a phylogeny of Bantu languages um, and calculated uh, trees using various methods. Um, and they showed that the, the Bantu languages uh, south and east of the equatorial rainforest uh, appear to be monophyletic, which means that they uh, have a common origin. Um, and it suggests that there was just a single passage through the rainforest and then uh, a divergence into lots of different clades uh, in southern Africa. Um, so, so that's a kind of interesting view that, that, that there was this kind of population bottleneck uh, and uh, one kind of migration out of the equatorial rainforests uh, southwards uh, and, and uh, into southern Africa. Anyway, moving on to Europe now. Um, it's thought there are at least five episodes of uh, settlement <coughs> of Europe uh, over the past 50,000 years, uh, significant settlement. There was pioneer colonization in what's known as the Upper Paleolithic around 50,000 years ago. This was after um, humans had left Africa uh, and started to, to move into the rest of the world um, and sweeping out of probably uh, West Asia into Europe. Then there was a glaciation which covered most of, of, of Europe and then recolonization after that, late, late on, from uh, what are known as southern refugia, places where humans were living in southern Europe, in, in, in coastal areas away from uh, the ice and moving back up. Uh, another recolonization 
uh, and then around 10,000 uh, years up to 4,000 years ago, Near Easterners coming in with a kind of Neolithic tool package um, and then small scale migrations, uh, uh, you know, trading around the Mediterranean and so forth and other uh, further into Europe during the Copper Age. So when we look at um, mitochondrial DNA haplotypes in Europe, we see um, a number of them predominate, but you can kind of analyze them in terms of uh, their prevalence um, and draw maps of how each particular uh, haplotype maps in terms of prevalence in Europe. So you can see that some of them, uh, this one here, the H1 haplotype, uh, has, seems to have its center of um, origin or certainly of, of highest prevalence in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, others center uh, in different areas, perhaps up in, 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 in Finland and, and Scandinavia. Uh, and so it's clear that the, the history of colonization of Europe is actually quite complex and we have obviously different migrations going on. Having said that, we have far fewer haplotypes in Europe than we have, say, in East Asia, and it does suggest that we have uh, fairly small uh, founding populations uh, coming out of um, uh, the, the out of Africa migration, um, and most of those haplotypes, you know, are in this N and the R haplogroups. So it's you know we know that that Europe really came quite late as a place for human settlement compared to other parts of the world. And as we mentioned in the Out of Africa talk, you know, places like Australia were getting colonized very, very quickly. Um, and that, as I mentioned earlier, that, that the concentration of certain haplotypes in certain regions suggests that those might have been refugia, particularly the Iberian Peninsula, in, uh, as a place where humans were living during the Ice Ages and then were able to spread back out and, and uh, recolonize parts of Europe. Um, so, this uh, is a more modern view coming into the, uh, the, the um, starting off about the, the black arrows there show that a long time ago, 45,000 years ago, and then this movement out of refugia, as, as they call them, um, at the end of the Ice Age, around 10 to 15,000 years, and then Neolithic farmers coming in from the Fertile Crescent. So in, in, in you've got these kind of three major waves, or three major processes going on in terms of populating Europe. When we look at Y chromosomes, again we have a certain number of restricted site, uh, kinds of Y chromosome in Europe, uh, different Y haplotypes, the, the R haplotypes, the I haplotypes. Um, we have some that appear to have originated outside of Europe recently, this J haplotype from the Middle East, uh, the E haplotype coming from Africa. And interesting, a paper that came out a couple of years ago, actually where they just drew, uh, looked at diversity, uh, genetic diversity within Europe, um, and they, they tried to draw a map of genetic diversity, trying to, they clustered things together, populations together according to genetic diversity, and what they found was that actually the genetic diversity they saw did reflect uh, the actual geography of Europe. So this is their clustering here, and they, they color coded according to the countries you see in the map up there. And so you can see uh, that, that Spain comes out down here, with Portugal in there as well. You can see Ireland, there's that red blob there on the edge of the British Isles, which is shown in, in pink there. Why don't I reserve battery power? I need to switch that. That's why. Um, so this is a kind of interesting that even though uh, you know, people have been moving around in Europe now. We, we you know, think that populations move around in Europe quite freely, but there clearly is a population signature there uh, that actually uh, does uh, still tell us about the, uh, the ancient roots of these populations. Um, if we look at some protein markers, many protein markers, they actually have a maximum or minimum uh, kind of frequency in the southeast corner of Europe. Uh, an area known as the Levant, that corner of the Mediterranean, um, and they decrease or increase smoothly as you move west and north. Um, and this, um, you know, it's a bit of a mystery because you think that post-Neolithic migrations were in all possible directions, um, and 
So really there's only two possible explanations for this. One is that there was this so-called Neolithic, Neolithic demic diffusion model where the post-glacial, the Neolithic farmers spread westwards and mixed with the local hunter-gatherers. Um, or it, it, there could have been cultural diffusion so that all of these um, farming and these other innovations were just spreading culturally and didn't involve major pe people movement. This, uh, um, these frequencies actually, this gradient in multiple genes supports the idea of this demic diffusion model, suggesting that there was actually movement of individuals, people from, um, the, from, from the Middle East into Europe carrying these technologies. It wasn't just that the technologies were moving through Europe uh, culturally as well. We mentioned language a moment ago uh, when talking about Bantu. Very interesting to look at languages in Europe. Uh, so uh, if we look at uh, the, 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 the languages of Europe, the predominant group is a group of languages known as uh, the Indo-European languages. Now, the story of this really began in, in 1786 uh, when a guy working in the British uh, civil service in Calcutta noticed that there were some, different, uh, some similarities between Sanskrit, on the one hand, and Greek and Latin. So the classic languages that people were learning at school, Greek and Latin, and Sanskrit, which was uh, a, a religious language uh, in the Indian subcontinent, which most of the religious texts were written. Um, and he noticed these similarities. A few years later, Thomas Young uh, coined the term Indo-European to take in these Indian language groups and the European language groups. Uh, Franz Bopp came up with uh, some, uh, a comparative grammar trying to collect all uh, the gram grammatical information together. In the mid-19th century, a guy called August Schleicher, uh, Schleicher came up with what he called the Stambaum Theorie, which uh, stands for uh, uh, tree, tree branch theory. Um, uh, which was basically showed that languages diverged in a very similar way to organisms, and, and he drew parallels with Darwin's theory of evolution. Interestingly, in the, in the history of Indo-European languages, another development came from a guy called Sassur, who tried to reconstruct, the people tried to sort of go back and back and say, well, what was the ancestor of Sanskrit and Greek and Latin? What did it look like? And he came up with a theory that there was a particular continent that was missing in modern languages that would have been the ancestral state that would have counted for the distribution of, of sounds in, in modern languages. And this is what you call the laryngeal consonant. Um, and he made this prediction and then a number of years later Hittite uh, was discovered. An ancient language was, was decoded and discovered to be an Indo-European language and discovered to have this laryngeal consonant. So it was a very nice example of predictive comparative linguistics. People have tried to reconstruct a Proto-Indo-European, but the key question also is when and where was this language spoken? So we, as English language speakers, uh, in fact, if we look here, across the world, Indo-European languages are the predominant languages across the world now. Uh, in dark green where most people speak Indo-European languages, in light green where Indo-European languages uh, have some kind of official status. If we go back, say, to 500 BC, this is the sort of picture we, we see here. There had been some diversification at that stage into uh, Celtic, Italic, Greek, Iranian, Indo-Aryan groups, and, and there's, the word's not labelled. The purple there is the Germanic group, which is the ancestor of, of English, German, Dutch, Scandinavian languages, and so forth. Um, if you look at the all those languages and you look at what words are conserved in those languages, i.e. have come from the ancestral language, then you can actually start to make reconstructions of what kind of society there was uh, among those primitive Indo-European speakers. Um, and you can see from the words for cattle, dogs, horses, there's clearly animal husbandry. These people <coughs> kept horses, they kept cows, they kept dogs. They had agriculture, they had cereal cultivation. They were living in a climate with winter snow, so they had uh, a, a seasonality that we expect to see in temperate zones. They had boats, they had wheels for carts. It appears they, they had a sky god, 
Uh, if you look at words like Jupiter and Zeus, uh, they are cognate, um, and there are other um, examples in comparative religion in these groups. That, 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 that there are parallels there. Uh, a tradition of poetry uh, and a patrilineal kinship system. These are the things that people have reconstructed. If we look at this, is Schleicher's reconstruction of primitive of the Indo-European groups. Um, and if we look more modernly, we see something like this, uh, where there's huge profusion of diversity uh, at the various uh, branches. But if we go back far enough, we can see these coalescing into primitive Indo-European at some stage uh, in, in the deep past. On this particular picture here, they're actually showing this is just one branch of the mother tongue. In fact, this is a very controversial issue as to whether we can actually get anywhere close to the original first language from which all languages are descended, or even whether all current languages are descended from a common ancestor. Uh, that, that is much more controversial. But there's no doubt that Indo-European languages have a common ancestor. There's some very early branches now being discovered that give us some insight. I to mention Hittite uh, as uh, the earliest uh, recorded Indo-European language that we have any um, writings in. Just to give you a feel for how this all, all kind of works in, in, in practical terms, uh, here are a, a number of... Uh, examples in different languages of a cognate word we're using biological jargon to say a series of homologues but they call them cognates in the language uh, and this is the word to, to bear uh, means carry and you can see that in Sanskrit in, in Greek in, uh, in Latin you can see clearly these similarities you can see this in Germanic in the ancestors of this is Gothic, one of the Germanic language, Old Irish, uh, back to Armenian. And at the top there is a reconstruction of this in, in primitive Indo-European. And you can see that not only is it the word roots that you can see similarities between, but the way in which the, the, the various derivatives of those stems, of those word roots, are actually uh, produced in terms of um, uh, the parts of the verb. There are similarities between these uh, languages. been various attempts to try and uh, translate it, uh, to, to, to actually recreate uh, primitive Indo-European. Schleicher did this back in 1868, and he came up with this, he tried to write a little fable in primitive Indo-European, which is written at the top there, that's Schleicher's version. Since then, there have been various attempts to reconstruct it, and you can see that they don't, they don't look that similar in, in, in many places, and different kinds of uh, ways of writing it as well. Uh, but, you know, there are still some similarities. It's, it's considered a kind of challenge among anyone studying this to see if they can actually come up with what the original Indo-European, primitive Indo-European would have looked like. Um, you can see that there are some things that are, seem to be similar. There's this always here for a sheep. Uh, it's commonly uh, used in these different ones below this motion. Uh, here we are, always again here. This would have in the word for, for sheep. And, and in English we have uh, the adjective ovine is cognate with that coming through Latin into English. So where did it come from, uh, this primitive Indo-European? Where did those people live? The, 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 the Anatolian hypothesis, Anatolia here, this part of what is modern Turkey, was this the, the, the primitive uh, the, the, the homeland? And they came into, this is, as we mentioned earlier, these waves of farmers bringing new technologies into Europe, was that the, the source? Uh, another idea is that they came from the Armenian highlands uh, up here, a little bit further over uh, to the east. Uh, and then a, 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 a more recent hypothesis, which I think probably is gaining ground here, so-called Kurgan hypothesis, um, proposed by Maria uh, Gimbutas, uh, named after these so-called kurgans, the uh, burial mounds uh, found on the, these Eurasian steppes uh, over here. Um, and what this says is that the Indo-Europeans were a nomadic tribe living on that Pontic uh, Caspian steppe. Um, and it was the taming of the horse that gave them that oomph to actually get out and then colonize 
uh, going westwards uh, and eastwards um, and actually spreading out um, uh, and their languages and their various branches dispersing. Um, and that's um, an, an interesting uh, hypothesis too. Uh, there's um, a recent paper uh, that came out from a group from New Zealand though where they looked at the various hypotheses um, and uh, despite what I just said, they favoured the Anatolian hypothesis that actually Indo-European uh, languages expanded uh, from Anatolia with the, the, the spread of agriculture. Um, and they drew a, a, a phylogenetic tree and they tried to uh, work out the timings of the various branches so that they could get some idea, you know, if you look at, we know that French and Latin and Spanish diverged from Latin, you know, started diversion from Latin about 2000 or, as they put here, 1700 years ago. So using that kind of approach, they tried to extrapolate back and they came up with a figure for primitive Indo-European of around 8,700 years ago. They also, there's a, an accompanying uh, commentary, there was an interesting uh, comparison made between languages and uh, biological evolution. So, and as you probably know about in, in, in evolution, we have uh, horizontal gene transfer, which is quite common. Uh, we have, for example, the bacterial lineage has donated mitochondria to the eukaryotic lineage. Uh, so there's been transfer from one lineage to another. They're just making the same point that we have the same things going on in language, that we have horizontal transfer of words. So in English, we have a large admixture of words from French, uh, so we have these words, one of those little uh, factoids, the words for uh, the animals out there in the field uh, derived from Anglo-Saxon uh, because the poor old Anglo-Saxons had to go and do all the hard work in the field. The Normans just saw the animals as the meat that they ate. So we have the words from French for beef, pork and mutton. Uh, uh, the, the words for the live animal coming from German as cow, swine and, and sheep. Uh, here's another uh, example. I think we're going to have to move on because I'm starting to run out of time here. So let's skip that and we'll skip that. Let's uh, look at now India briefly. Uh, what about mitochondrial DNA in India? Um, so there's a study done here looking at uh, colonization of India and different uh, mitochondrial haplogroups, groups. Um, and it's thought that uh, there was this one haplogroup, group, hap group M, that perhaps represents the original inhabitants of India, and that these Indo-Europeans, the, the kind of the, 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 basically you can divide Indian societies into two groups. There are those where there is a caste system, uh, and uh, mainly Hindus, um, and then there are these ones that are outside the, the caste system, uh, often represented by tri various tribal groups. Um, and it's thought that this haplogroup M is the kind of original population in India and that those caste societies came later. Um, so, uh, again, another haplotype here in Y chromosomes, we have this uh, K-star haplotype, common in the uh, tribal uh, groups, but not in the caste kind of uh, societies, caste groups. There's an M haplotype, uh, and this was probably brought into India by the Zoroastrians. So you may or may not know about there was a migration uh, with the rise of Islam uh, and sweeping into Iran. Iran before then, Zoroastrianism, this ancient religion that goes back to Zarathustra or Zoroaster, uh, these individuals were persecuted, marginalized, and many of them fled to India. Uh, and, and you can see a signature there. They're now called the Parsis, the descendants of those individuals, but obviously many of them married out and, and took this haplotype into the surrounding population. Uh, Mongolians. Here's a recent paper from a couple of years ago. Um, and here, again, they were able to try and reconstruct the, the history. And they came up with uh, what they um, said were the, the caste uh, groups and the tribal groups. And in terms of rough and ready terms... Um, you have um, the, the, the caste group being Dravidian language speakers inhabiting southern India, tend to have darker skin, uh, whereas Indo-European speakers inhabit, 
have it in northern India, uh, and we have these Tibetan groups. And then we have this tribal group that uh, are in, in small fragmented groups. But what they found was it actually wasn't quite a clear picture. You have this kind of spectrum between these two different groups. So they put the ancestral North Indian and ancestral Southern Indian, as they call them. And uh, you get a kind of blending of those two groups as you go from the South to the North in India. Uh, and so they've been clearly mixing together for, for long periods of time. In Asia, we have the Han Chinese as the, large, the world's largest tribe, 1.4 billion members. Uh, various uh, <coughs> uh, possible explanations for how this Han Chinese culture spread, similar to what we were saying before in Europe. You have the idea of the demic diffusion model where there's movement of people, or is it just that the culture is moving and that people are adopting uh, the culture? Um, it appears that there are there are there is now evidence for at least three migrations within China. There's the first wave, um, a very large migration of, uh, of around one million, just under one million people uh, during the the Jin Dynasty. A second um, migration, even involving all, even more people during the Tang Dynasty, and then this third migration uh, with five million immigrants during the the, the Southern Song Dynasty. Um, you get a clear gradient. It's a bit like in India as well. You have a clear difference between the people that live in the north of China and those that live in the south of China. And again, this, these migrations from the north down to the south, taking the Han uh, Chinese culture. But you do actually get differences in those uh, cultures. One interesting finding you find also in Asia is that you have this haplogroup C uh, in, in, mitochondria, in, in, in sorry, Y chromosome haplotypes. Uh, and it's thought that this probably represents the male uh, line descendants of Genghis Khan. So if you trace back, when did this haplogroup arise? It's about a thousand years ago. The distribution maps nicely onto where you'd expect to find it if it were Genghis Khan as the ancestor. And he's an individual who had great power, had lots of, con lots of wives, lots of concubines, and had lots of children. <coughs> <coughs> right, last, last five minutes. It's a bit rough to try and squeeze it the last five minutes, but we have to. What about America? America, it's clear that the Americas were populated last of all. Um, uh, there was this connection between Asia and North America called Beringia during the last glacial max maximum. Um, and you can, you can see this region here between uh, what is now Siberia and what is now Alaska. And this provided a land bridge uh, between them. But as you can see, as time goes on, the, the land bridge disappears. Um, it's thought that perhaps the donor population for the Americas was actually living in Beringia for some period of time. And, and perhaps the donor population that actually gave rise to the modern Native American populations, it no longer survived. It, it, we can't look to see where it was. There's some lively debate about when America were, the Americas were, co uh, were colonized. The traditional figures are around between 13, 14, 15,000 years. But there have been the so-called pre-Clovis <laughs> sites have been described, and one particularly in Brazil, thought to be uh, 30,000 years ago. That, that has been questioned by scholars, and it, the general consensus is we had this about 15,000 years ago. If we look at language groups, we've got three main language groups in Americas. This uh, has led people to suggest that there was actually three migrations. It wasn't just one migration, and that there were three kind of blitzkriegs coming in from Asia. But interestingly, if we compare what we see with these language distributions and what we see when we look at DNA-based genetics, we don't see any evidence for three different populations coming in. So here there's clearly a kind of conflict uh, between what the language groups uh, and the kind of ethnic classifications are telling us and what the um, uh, genetics is telling us. Um, at the moment, there is a consensus that there probably was a single migration into the Americas. But it's a shallow consensus. It's still one of those things that people are having a lively debate on. Um, if you look at mitochondrial DNA in Siberia, you see all this variation. And 
But in a sense, uh, Native Americans are kind of honorary Siberians or derivative Siberians, because you can see the Native American haplotypes scattered here among the different Siberian haplotypes. Uh, so this is consistent with the idea that Siberia was the ancestral homeland, that's where most diversity is, and then there was some kind of bottleneck as a small number of populations uh, moved in. It's not quite that simple because there are some uh, frequencies, haplotype frequencies in Native Americans that are quite different from what we see in Asia. Uh, and there's one rare haplotype, this X haplotype, again, not present in Asian populations. So we don't have a clear, simple picture of what went on there. Um, and we'd also see reduced variation in Y haplotypes in Native Americans, uh, really quite poor resolution there, again, suggesting that there was one single uh, event. A couple of uh, spanners in the works. If you look at uh, early uh, remains from the Americas, and you reconstruct their facial features, their racial features, ethnic features, they don't look like modern Native Americans. This guy in particular, Kennewick Man, caused a lot of trouble uh, because he doesn't look like a Native American. In fact, he looked more like a European when people first looked at it. Uh, it's now unclear what kind of uh, person it was. I'm trying to get DNA out of this sample, but they haven't got this. It's a bit like Patrick Stewart, Star Trek, yeah. uh, in the reconstruction there. There was a lot of interesting hoo-ha that went around this, because some Native American groups claimed this skeleton, and said this is ours, we must bury it according to our tribal rights and so forth. Uh, but there was no relationship, clear relationship, to any existing Native American group. Uh, it was initially thought that maybe it was a proto-Scandinavian that had uh, 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 gone across uh, or something. And another group of people said that they were Vikings and they uh, worshipped the ancestors, uh, the, you know, they worshipped the ancient Viking gods and they claimed this guy as one of theirs uh, as well. And it, it kind of created a bit of controversy, all a bit, a bit silly. But it, at the moment we still don't have a clear answer on this. Um, and... There are some ex there are different explanations for this. One is that there was um, the biological variation was because of lots of variable numbers of migratory waves, that there were these Paleo-Americans and then Amerindians coming in. Another idea is that there was just a lot of diversification, uh, phenotypic se uh, the selection for different phenotypic features in those populations. Nearly finished now. We don't quite know either where they, which route they took. And just as a stop press last year, a remarkable finding, we've spoken about Neanderthals, ancient Neanderthals, we actually got the first Paleo-Eskimo genome um, from 4,000 years ago. Um, and this, uh, skeleton, this, uh, from this skeleton, they extracted DNA and they got uh, into finding, uh, um, well, actually, sorry, they got it from hair. Um, and they, they were able to show that this fitted well with the Hapla groups that you see now in Northeast Asia, in, in Siberia. Um, no European component. Um, and that's me finished, actually. Sorry, I've kind of not paced this as well as I should, I should have done. But just, just in conclusion, so we've spoken about the diversification of Africa, the San and the Bantu, San, the earliest groups. We've spoken about gene gradients and the Indo-Europeans tribes and castes in India, hand migrations, and then uh, the peopling of the Americas via Beringia, uh, but the routes and modes unclear. Got a couple of seconds there for a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone has any.